to the sound of the 80s. It's a new year and a new chart. And as young as ever, it's top of the box. 1980, start of a brand new decade with a whole new generation of British pop stars. It had been all we'd been aiming for. I think it was just absolutely incredible to be on it at all. I had Leo Sayers wig and Phil Oakey had half of Diana Ross's wig. That was the Thursday night on the Saturday morning we sold the call for million records and I couldn't walk down the street anymore. It will be a year of change for Top of the Pops, which began 1980 still mired in its light entertainment past, with a long-serving orchestra and outdated working practices. So don't touch that. That's someone else's job. But later in this year, the show would get a new producer. Right, hey, q -trap. Through a radical makeover. It's absolutely wonderful. It's just like New Year's Eve. Let's start off a madness. The whole place live and that was a bit of an injection of enthusiasm to the whole show. Mike Michael Tin, you're Russ Abbott, aren't you? Yeah. Oh. Complete with new showbiz guest presenters. The Madam Panda Ants are going to take you for a walk in the park. Come in. Careful, careful. Come in. How come you always have to turn around? Russ, please. of the old school top of the pops way of doing things is the unfortunate cutaway shots that you would see uh, during the vapors performance of turning japanese i guess when i thought and dreamt about but if i was going to be on top of the pops i didn't think i'd be sharing the screen with sumo wrestlers that was never in the plan They put all these Japanese images up. I guess it was something to do with the lyrics of the song. We thought, well, that's a nice touch. And then, then these images just kept on coming all through the song. You know, when we went home and watched it the next night, you know, everyone crowds into the living room. And it seemed to be we didn't really get much of a look in. Oh, this is the vapors and honey, Japanese. 
So, the second time we do it, you've got to remember I'm playing on a completely ridiculous drum kit made of plastic cymbals pads on the drums and in my naivety I thought I'm on TV so I've got to play along exactly as it is on the record otherwise someone's going to notice that we might, we're miming and then I dropped a drumstick and I thought that's okay I can quickly retrieve it from around the side and get back and no one will notice or at worst they'll realise and they'll edit that bit out it's got to be easy to edit out message came down from the gallery, we've got to go again. So we did a second take, and what they've done is they've kept the first part, with, which includes Howard's stick gate incident, and then they do the edit afterwards to what was presumably the second take. So uh, so they preserved his uh, ignominious moment for posterity. People sometimes, you know, can be, oh, you were on top of the pops, weren't you? And then you know the next question's coming. Did you drop your trump stick when you were on top of the pops? In April 1980, the Top of the Pops Orchestra kept the flag flying for old school light entertainment with the British Eurovision entry by Prima Donna. And it'd be a close run thing between them and a young callow Irishman. Johnny Logan was a number one artist, really, in the tradition of Top of the Pops from three or four years before. He looked like a 70s star. I think he was really, really the housewife's favourite because he was the sort of boy that mums would want their daughter to go out with. There was a huge innocence. What's another year? It was genuine. That's probably the real the thing. It wasn't put on, it wasn't acting out. I wasn't trying to be kitsch. That's the way I was. What's another year to someone who's getting used to being alone? So many decisions were made for me. Somebody from the record company was given the job of taking me to a shop and getting me clothes to do Top of the Bobs. And the clothes were awful. I don't wear jackets draped on my shoulder. It's just the way somebody saw me look, you know. They wanted a vocal version of a guy called Bobby Crush was a piano player who was a huge guy back in the 70s. And the record company said, we've got somebody who's perfect for this market. And, you know, that's what they wanted. But the bands that I was interested in, I really liked the Stranglers, the Pistols. I wanted to be doing the stuff that was happening at the time. I wanted to suddenly leap from once another year into, you know, like sort of the new romantic period and or I was 24 years old in one of his final appearances on Top of the Pops backstage Johnny encountered a young band who thought they were about to be the future of pop music we were thrown into a melting pot with people who were ostensibly nothing like what we wanted to be or aspire to and so we were we wanted to hate you know a little bit of OMD uh, I was going to twat the, um, the lead singer in the dressing room because he was a bit, uh, shall we say, not as respectful as I thought he should have been. What's another year? The truth is that on top of the pops in 1980, old-fashioned Johnny might have had that encounter with any one of a vast range of musical tribes. What's another year? 
Synth Futurists OMD fought for the limelight with Headbangers Mods Rude Boys Teddy Boys And this unique tribe of young soul rebels Come with me just a bit And I will introduce you to some people from Birmingham by the name And next is Midnight Runners Kevin's a friend of mine, I've got a lot of respect for Kevin He's a very passionate guy, what you see and what you hear with them is, is, is real. They started out very much like a tribal or a gang mentality. With him, it was a whole philosophy, it was a lifestyle, and the, the music kind of embodied that. It was my culture. You know, it was that feeling of belonging, you know, of being part of something. I realised that people would want to feel again. That's what happened after punk for me. I realised that people would want to feel, feel more, and you know, be glamorous and look good. It was everything. I was completely obsessed with it. The Dexys Midnight Runners. I mean, I remember seeing them in the music machine, which was the, the club in Camden Town. To see another band, and they all came marching in, and this was a night out for Dexys. They all had their bags, scarves, woolen hats, and they all stood in a line at the front of the concert. The New York Dockers thing, how we got that was Jim, who used to play the trombone, he walked into the rehearsal room one day and he, he had a woolly hat on because it was winter. He had a donkey jacket, his collar up, and he was playing the trombone, and he looked fantastic. It was a great look. Back image was stuck in my mind. What you wore was everything. It always took loads of work. Massive attention to detail. Unlike their punk predecessors, such as The Clash, who turned their nose up at Top of the Pops. Musical tribes wanted to be seen and to entertain, and came drilled and dressed for every show. In 1980, Madness had a different look for every Top of the Pops. It was always an idea that we'd dress up or do something theatrical when we appeared. We had a very good connection with a costumiers in Canada called Berman and Nathan's, which is really serious. It wasn't like some crummy old fancy dress shop. And I remember once we got our hands on these authentic copper uniforms and we, we heard that the Clash were rehearsing around the corner. And we steamed into their dressing room and there was just the sound of toilets flushing and doors slamming. They never spoke to us for five years.